But first of all, let me introduce Marcus Westbury. Now, I'm assuming most of you know Marcus Westbury to some extent or have met him or been a part of one of the many events that he's organised over the years or many of the projects he's been part of. But if you haven't, my, my brief potted history goes back to the Next Wave Festival where Marcus was... What was your title? The creative director? The uh, artistic director. Artistic director of the Next Wave Festival. Um, a very... Um, a, a, a very successful period in the history of the Next Wave Festival. Um, and then um, Marcus started Renew, uh, Renew Newcastle, and I think this is probably one of the things Marcus is most well known for, a project around essentially rejuvenation. And we'll talk about that um, a bit tonight. Um, and then that led on to a, a wider project, a wider Australia-wide project called Renew Australia. And then amongst um, these very exciting projects, which do interfere, Inter interface with the idea of the city. And I should probably say I'm an architect and an urban designer, so I think I'm here because um, I'm interested in cities and I talk about cities. I used to do a bit of radio. Um, so after that, Marcus um, did a couple of, has done a couple of TV shows. Um, not quite hard. Yep. Um, which would have been what year, Marcus? It was actually before Renew, 2007 and 2008. Was that pre-date Renew? Yeah, it does, yeah. Oh, there we go. Renew okay. partially came from a failed idea for a third television series. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then in Bespoke, your more recent television yes. series, you, you yeah. revisit that, you revisit the Renew project yeah. and reflect on it um, as, it's, as it's maturing. Um, so two major pieces of TV, um, which were... Are they still available on iView, uh, Bespoke? Was it taken...? Uh, bespoke? Uh, no, you can, you can buy it on iTunes and, and they might tap it back up on iView at some point. Right. Um, and then recently, uh, earlier this year, um, Marcus was appointed the CEO of the Contemporary Arts Precincts, which is an exciting project and we'll talk a bit about that tonight as it builds on some of this fascinating period of work, uh, which is essentially... Um, one of the key sites of Melbourne in Collingwood, near near and around the Keith Harry mural on Johnson Street. So that's my potted history of uh, history of Marcus Westbury. I wanted to start, Marcus, and this will be a bit of a question and answer type of session. We'll um, open it up for questions from the floor. So um, towards towards the end, or when we've genuinely run out of interesting things <laughs> to say, um, we'll we'll open it up for questions. They'll be aimed at Marcus, not not. Not me, I'm just here to ask questions myself. Um, so I wanted to start, Marcus, by, you know, as a way into, um, a way into, the, oh, sorry, the other thing, of course, I should talk about is the book. Um, and I think the other reason, or the reason Marcus is here is because he's now written the book, and this is the Wheeler Centre. So this book, um, Creating Cities, is really a fantastic, quite personal history of um, the Renew project, of this sort of returning um, to Newcastle, Marcus from Newcastle originally, down in Melbourne, going back and in some ways kind of saving a city. Um, and the way that is done is it was a very different way into which people like me, architects and urban designers and planners tend to think about how you might save a place. Um, so the, the Creating Cities book will be kind of our key armature for this discussion. And I should mention now, just in case I forget, um, the book is for sale at the, uh, at the front of the room or the back of the room um, from the Sun Bookstore if you wish to uh, purchase a copy of it. I think it's very reasonably priced. <laughs> uh, very good <laughs> sales pitch, excellent. It is, it is, a, very great, it is, it is a great book and if, it, it, we'll get onto it in a bit, I think, and talk about the, about the funding model for the book itself and the form of the book uh, is very interesting. But I guess I'm going to start, Max, the question, which was what led you, after doing Renew, to go, I need to capture this in the form of the book. I need to tell this story in this most traditional of media. Do you want the compelling answer or the honest one? Uh, I think we all want the honest one. Yeah, I was broke. <laughs> and um, I, I, I had actually thought about doing a book for a while. I, like, I, this, is, this is actually my third or fourth go at writing a book. About uh, I don't know, sometime in the late 90s, I actually had a publishing contract to write a non-fiction book that I took so long to write it was superseded by a dozen other books and it was just too late to get it out there. And then um, I reached a bit of a dead end with Renew. It wasn't paying me very well. There was this huge community of interest. Like every time I travelled around the country, you know, I was visiting towns and cities and communities and people were very interested in Renew, but there was no mechanism by which I could convert that into a living. And so uh, at a particularly low ebb, uh, my day job stopped paying me, but I had to do it anyway. 
I, um, I thought I could crowdfund a job, which would be writing a book. And so um, I had all these notes. I'd, I'd done a lot of I'd, I'd done a lot of documentation along the way. I'd been writing in my travels and um, other things. And so I thought, oh yeah, I can just you know. I thought it would be a quick and painless process to take all of that and turn it into a book. And so I went out and uh, ran a crowdfunding campaign. It was really successful. It was a was it to uh, break a few records? I recall. Yeah, um, it was the fastest. I tried to raise ten thousand dollars. It hit that target in less than twenty four hours. And um, in the end, I raised more than. Uh, Forty thousand dollars, and uh, pre-sold I think a thousand books or something like that. Um, I think it was the second largest number of supporters at that time for any project ever on Possible. Um, so it was really, it was really. I mean, there was something incredibly validating about that because I think it, it actually come out of being at a very low ebb, and so just the the reassurance that someone actually believed in what I was doing and was willing to back it was, was fantastic. Um, and then, and then I, I sort of, I'd naively promised a book in about nine months because I, like I'd already had the word count. Like I had lots of you know, notes. I thought I'd just go away and massage them all into a book and book. Um, and has anyone here read, written a book before? Um, does it work like that? <laughs> you know, I sort of went away and put it all together and then gave it to the editor and she just said, look, this is a steaming mess, basically. You, you sort of got three different books here that they don't really add up into, you know, a coherent story. And so, in the end, it took, rather than taking nine months, it took, I think, two years or a bit over two years to actually finish the book and get it out. Um, uh, but, but, you, you know, re- as, a, as, well, as one of those original um, crowd funders, I remember there were very regular updates from you about, the, I'm mostly still writing on the li- book. Li- yeah, it's like the why that, you know, why I haven't finished my homework <laughs> excuse. Yeah, there were lots of reasons, but I, I think it was really important. I think it's really important if you do a crowdfunded project to bring people along with you. You can't just have a, um, a void of information, have people not know what's happening and why. So I was very conscious of making sure that the community that supported the book, and, and I think from the second, once I realised I wasn't hitting the crowdfunding, the deadline, uh, every update included a little qualifier that said, you know, if you want your money back, I'll give you your money back. I haven't, and no one ever took me up on that. So um, that was great. And so, yeah, it took, it took a couple of years, but I think in the end I was really, really happy, you know, I ended up with a much, much better book than I would have if I had, um, you know, turned out that first pile of whatever it was. And it is, Creating Cities uh, is, is the name of the book, and um, you start off with a very, uh, it, it's almost autobiographical, you start off with a very personal story about your own memories of Newcastle, and you, and you even though it is very much a book about contemporary urbanism and activity and place making, it sort of starts off with a slight um, autobiographical mm. feel. Was that a very deliberate choice to try and tell this, this sort of bigger story through the personal? I think that was, in the end, that was the choice I made. I think that, the, the, again, going back to that point where I had a steaming mess that wasn't quite a book, um, part of it was a kind of ranty manifesto, part of it was personal observation, part of it was a kind of critique of the field of, um, you know, urbanism and whatever. And, and I think, in the end, the thread that ties that together is the arc that led me to doing this project. Like, it's actually observation of city and place and community. I don't, I, I don't have any formal qualifications in any of this stuff. I don't have the, the, you know, I don't have a survey of the literature to fall back on or terms to drop it. So, ultimately, I, I have to... I, I sort of wrote up from the observations of the city as I saw it and the problem that I saw that I was trying to solve. And, um, you know, to, to sort of frame that, it required a context of what Newcastle was and what the what had happened to that place that had created, you know, the decay that was so evident. And I think it, it also, for those who don't know, it's probably worth um, talking a bit about what the, what the Renew process really was centred to do and one through observation. It really was. It really was focused on the main street, or Hunter Street, in yeah. in Newcastle. The key observation, Marcus, at the time when you first started looking at this, was really, and you tell the story where you were actually looking to set up a bar, and you just found it very hard to set up a bar. Yeah. So, I mean, at, at the time, so Newcastle had 150 empty buildings in the tomb. Well, I counted 150 empty buildings. There were more empty pro- shop fronts, effectively. Empty, sh- well, visibly empty sh- spaces from the street. So, uh, in some cases, they were they were above street level. But you know, uh, there was more than 100 empty shops and other you know entire buildings that you could see were were empty. So, um, and my assumption, I'd gone back to Newcastle the year before, and what I wanted to do, they just changed the liquor licensing laws in New South Wales, so they could have small bars, and I thought, you know, this, I'd had this idea for a long time, that I'd, you know, Newcastle would be a great place for a little hole in the wall, 
you know, bar with a Myers Place of the North. Yeah, exactly. Like almost exactly, you know, like that kind of model. I thought it was it sort of really needed it. And so what I discovered was that despite this huge, huge surplus of property, I, I couldn't get real estate agents to return my phone calls. Like, you know, like I was just like, I want to rent, I, w- I would like to rent. I a- want to give you money. Yeah, I would like to rent. I've got some money in the bank. I'm not an idiot. I've done stuff. I would like to start a bar. Could you please give me a call? And, um, you know, it was weird. Like, you know, the, dis- the reality that, you know, the more I unpacked it, the reality was most of the properties weren't actually seriously for rent. You know, like they were tax deductions, they were write-offs. So people had, you know, given up on renting. They had, they had numbers, they changed the area codes um, in the late 90s. Like, you know, from uh, Newcastle, you have six-digit phone numbers and then in the late 90s, it moved to eight-digit phone numbers. And there were still four lease signs with six-digit phone numbers in <laughs> like a decade <laughs> and a bit later. Like, you know, like, and, and uh, the, the agents whose numbers are in the window didn't represent the owners anymore or couldn't track them down or, you know, it's just, it, it's just become incredible incredibly self-perpetuating and the bigger lesson I kind of took out of that was that um, and I, sh- I shared that story a bit I shared it through social media I talked to people about it I you know I had a decent community of interest and lots of people came back to me with a version of that same story they'd wanted to do something they'd wanted to start something they wanted to create something and for whatever reason the system did not take them seriously and and they couldn't get a toehold to actually get an idea up and these were people what they had in common was they were people who had imagination they had initiative they had drive they didn't have capital they didn't have lawyers they didn't have you know um, planning consultants they didn't for the most part, they didn't have architects, you know, but they had an idea and they had the capacity to do the thing. They didn't have the capacity to navigate the process to get to doing the thing. And the more I sort of started to realise this, the more I became very conscious that there was this huge, it was a, you know, it was like a dam wall of people who had um, ideas and the biggest failure in Newcastle at that time was the people who wanted to do things there couldn't. And so that's a market that's essentially not working. Yeah, it's a completely dysfunctional market. It's a whole set of systems too. It's it's, it's you know it comes from the um, the market. And, you know, it's it's a pure kind of you know capitalist problem on one level, but it's also a bunch of regulatory fails. It's a, it's a bunch of system failures from government and process and others where they put bad incentives and bad processes in the way that privilege people who have capital resources and connections and make it very difficult for people who don't have those things. And then the real, the real genius of the project of the Renew Newcastle project was to do some incredibly hard work, talk to existing building owners and essentially convince them to lease out their properties for free to creatives. Would that be the core um, summary? To, to, well, uh, lease? Oh, no, no. No, no. Oh, yes. no. Let's talk Li- about Licence. <laughs> uh, no, don't ever use the word lease. Scares people. Yes. Uh, to lend... Uh, in, in sure, in, com- in, in, you know, in, in common sense language, they... Um, they lent us their otherwise empty buildings on the condition that we would give them back when they got a better offer. But in the interim, we would in turn lend them to someone who had an idea for a thing that they wanted to do or wanted to start. So we took, you know, and and we've done, I think we're up to about 80 properties. We've reopened in Newcastle and 220-ish projects that we've launched. And every single one of those has taken place in a space that by default would have been empty for years. And so, and then a variety of different, but creatives is the sort of broad catch-all, I guess. Yeah. Of, of the well, sort you had of to, you had to make, it had to be a creative or community project. Mm. You needed to, you could be trying to start a business. We, we welcomed people that had commercial intent in what they were trying to do, but it had to be original. Had to not be competing with the existing business in the city. And you, if you were, ma- you, if you were selling something, you needed to make what you do. So there seems to be to be two creative acts in that. One is 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 getting around this problem of leasing and going to and finding other mm. models of occupying space and there's a whole there's, and, there's a, and there's a sort of a history of that idea that goes back to squatting essentially mm. formalizing that and then and then the other is the curation the creative curation of the people who wanted to go mm. to go in would it be fair to say they're the t- they were the two like where's the design the design is the design of the systems that allow and the curation yeah, and I think I, I'm also very conscious of, like, I've done arts festivals before. I've done, you know, my, my background prior to this have been working arts festivals or projects where they were very reliant on my own taste. I was very conscious. Like, curation, I, I, it, it is a form of creation. I'm also really nervous about that word because it implies that what you're trying to do is pick things that you like. Yes. And that's actually not what we were trying to do. We were trying to pick a really wide range of things, or support, really, a really wide range of things that we thought someone would like. 
you know, like not necessarily that, that you know, I think it's really important to recognise that, you know, we've done projects from people that were retirees and teenagers and everything in between. And it's quite consciously not an exercise in trying to pick a taste. So what we're looking for is a sense, you know, we need to know that you're going to be, if we give you a property, we need to know you're going to be responsible with it. If you're proposing to start a project or a business doing something, we need to see that you've got some evidence that you can do that thing. Mm. Um, but as much as anything, we're just backing people who are backing themselves, you know. And you talk in the book and you've talked generally in, in, in your many lectures because one of the things you've done is sort of been on a sort of almost sort of 10-year sort of tour of the country talking about this. It, you, you talk about the importance of failure, of, of allowing things to fail. Mm. Does that fit into this broader idea of curation? That, that I think, um, well, I think I, I really like risk. I think risk, I think risk is a, you know, it's got a bad rap, you know. Like, uh, well, yeah, it's risk, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, I really like the idea. Like, I th I th look, if you take a city like Newcastle, the biggest challenge for a long time, the strategy had been about lots of people trying to pick winners. You know, like, like what you wanted to know was what was going to work, and then you would invest a lot of resources into doing that. And my assumption has always been, I don't know what's going to work. So how do I make the price of failure low enough that it doesn't really matter if it doesn't? Like, you don't have to mortgage your house, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to, uh, whatever, you know, give up your job, you know, you don't, um, you're not in a situation where the financial and practical risk of trying an idea that might not work is so daunting that, that you don't do it. And so, I think, to me, that's the way I like to think about, I think about risk is like, you know, it's allowing things to not work, but allowing, but but sort of putting in place structures that if they don't work, you, you don't bring a larger system down with them or you don't blow $100 million or, you know, like, um, you know, small failures are actually really important. And I think, particularly in a city where, uh, I had this one moment, I think of the stories in the book, I had this one moment where this guy, it was a real estate agent, I was talking to him about my small bar idea. And bearing in mind, they just changed the laws. There were no small bars in New South Wales. So I finally got this guy on the phone and said there was one particular property that I thought would be great and I knew it because a friend of mine's family had once had a business there and so I'd been through it. I thought, absolutely perfect. I got the guy on the phone. I said, oh, look, you know, I'd like to rent this thing for a small bar and whatever. And he said, um, uh, what, sorry, what do you want to do? I said, oh, it's a small bar. He said, well, what's, what's that like? And I said, what do you mean? It's like a small bar. Like, you know, like they've got in Melbourne. He said, I've never been to Melbourne. What's it like around here? And I was like, um, well, it's not. You can't... The point is that there haven't been any yet. And he said, look, mate, if I don't understand what it is, I can't be bothered showing you the property. And I thought, like, it's the absolute perfect definition of, you know, like... Inherently, you've got a city with 150 empty buildings and the real estate agent is looking for something that is like something that was there once. Mm. Like, inherently, that's the one thing you know does not work. Yes. The stuff that's gone the knowledge is that what is doesn't work. The, the, the street represent the knowledge of what doesn't work and nothing else. Yeah, it and it's just like, you know, looking for those sort of precedents. So, I think, you know, what you want to do is turn that over so that you could actually throw lots of relatively random, low-risk, low-scale, but great if they come off ideas at the wall and whatever sticks will inherently work. And I think as I sort of alluded to before, what interests me about this project, and it isn't, for those of you who haven't been to Newcastle, or at least seen it on, on Max's TV show, it is, a, it is a palpable sense of activity and liveliness and it is a remarkably successful piece of urbanism, I, I would argue it's a piece of urbanism. But the design, it, w it wasn't about design, it wasn't about design of objects and that's what's been really challenging for I guess, uh, and really interesting for us in the in some of the design professions that we suddenly see someone who's able to seemingly bypass, I know it wasn't bypassing, but seemingly bypass a whole lot of regulatory stuff and actually get to the core of the problem uh, without presupposing the, the strategy to solve the problem. The problem being a failed street. Um, so f I think that's, that's, that's what's fascinated a, a, lot, a lot of us about the process. I wanted to talk, Max, a little bit about that regulatory um, hmm. bypassing and there's a few and also kind of the role of government um, local governments and state governments and, and, and federal governments and how bureaucracy does and doesn't help this kind of project because it would be my assumption on the whole based on hearing you speak about this that for example the local government in Newcastle did not facilitate or essentially assist this process of renewal until they began to claim it as their own success. Yeah, they. I, I th well, yes. There's an element of that. I mean, I don't think they've been unfair in claiming, you know, in claiming it. But um, I think th the reality is that it was a process that was out. 
it was outside the box. Like it was just, it was no one's job, right? Like, you know, there was no one who had the job description to think about this problem. There were people who did culture in the city and predominantly they either ran institutions or they invested in, um, uh, you know, arts projects and whatever. The people that did, there was an entire city revitalization team in Newcastle that I had never met. Like they just draw up fictitious master plans of non-existent cities and buildings that aren't there. Uh, and, you know, like I don't, I just don't, I literally don't exactly know what they do. And then there's a whole, the, like this, the problem that I was identifying was basically a category error. It just doesn't fit anyone's job. And so initially I think, you know, the, as you're sort of prodding around the edges of that bureaucracy trying to say, can you facilitate or support this project? And everyone is um, either sort of protective in a sort of turf sense, or they want to send you somewhere else, or they want to, you know, or requires a policy shift that takes three years to navigate through the process. So, you know, if, you know, a lot of the time, that, and I've had this with other projects, but a lot of times the response is, that's great, can you do it in 18 months' time when we've gone through 16? Well, you know, we, budget, we just need yeah. to get the election done and the budget and the new strategic plan and whatever. And one of the other things that I, I've become incredibly conscious of through this process is that momentum is a real thing. Like, you know, like you, like you can't blunt momentum and expect people to still want to do things. If you wake up today and you're motivated and you're passionate about the idea of doing something and you meet someone who will support you to get to the next step, you will keep going. If you wake up today and you're motivated and passionate about doing something and you meet someone who says, sorry, no, or someone who says, just come back to me in 18 months' time, you're, we don't, we, we're just not wired to do that. Mm. So, uh, I think that, you know, those were the big, the big problems. And then there were regulatory issues, and I think the regulatory stuff is really interesting because I'm not a, like, a free market, anti public you know, um, anti-regulation libertarian, although I've seen myself picked up in a couple of those arguments. I, the argument that I would run is that we have lost a sense of proportionality. You know, so this idea, like if you put a $5,000, $10,000 compliance cost onto someone who's building a half million dollar development, it is not particularly likely to stop that from happening. It's proportional to the thing you're trying to do. Mm. If you put a $5,000, $10,000 compliance cost onto someone who is, do, do you literally doesn't have any capital, it is the reason why they can't do it. And so trying to create, and, and it's been, we've been very conscious with Renew of trying to create systems that um, are proportional to what it is a person is trying to do. And we've done that through a whole bunch of hacks and backdoor methods. It's meant that we can't do a lot of stuff. We can't do liquor and performance and all those sorts of things that, that require... And building red, works. Building works, you know, like we can't, we've done, we've done 220 projects, I think we're up to three or four DAs in 220 projects, because the moment you enter that system, mm. you're, you're killing the momentum, you're taking on a capital cost that's significant, and you're, um, you know, the cost of administering the process becomes the risk that you then have to manage. DA for uh, is New South Wales for planning application. Oh, right, yeah. It's Didn't realise that was uh, slightly different state specific. It is, yeah. it is. Oh, um, and uh, I think that's also one of the geniuses of the process is working within those sort of regulatory environments and not, and still being creative. But the the Emporium, um, the old department mm. store was it the was it David Jones? It was it old David Jones? Yeah, the old David Jones in Hunter Street. That's that's one of those projects that really began to evolve the idea a little bit. Um, mm. Can you explain what you did with the Emporium? Yeah, so there was, uh, around the same time that we began Renew Newcastle, David Jones, which was the last substantial, you know, entity really trading in that part of the city, um, they announced that they were leaving and sort of six or 12 months later they left. And so what it left behind was basically an entire, if you imagine taking Meyer or David Jones out of the Burke Street Mall, left behind a bigger street frontage than that actually. So an entire city block basically that was dead to the world. Because it's a long, it's a huge site, and because it's a long-term development site, like no one will ever reuse it as a department store. People are very reluctant to spend capital on it. From our point of view, what we wanted to do was make sure the street was active again. So we basically built a petition, and literally, legally, the petition is a. Um, it's a, fit, a fixture or a fitting. It, it is not a, a, an it's intervention. It's extraordinary. It's, it's, yeah, it is not, uh, it's literally not attached to the building. Like yeah. it is, I think it is now. We've, we've changed the DA. But in its initial incarnation, what we realised is the moment you affix the petition to the building, you've actually made a, it's a heritage listed building. It's all that stuff. Mm. So we basically set up a way of building a theatre prop that actually blocks people off from entering the interior of the building, um, still allowing for the access and the egress, all that stuff, and then created basically the old window bays in the department store that wrap around um, two streets 
um, have been converted into individual tenancies for local artisans or makers or designers or people that are doing that sort of stuff. And it's, it's you know, I think in its original incarnation, it was something in the order of $15,000 to do. And we did it in a matter of weeks. Yeah. And it's a, it's a big project. And I think that the, the, the strength of that idea is that use of the windows, is, is that you, which ultimately is about the use of the street. The yeah. Renewal is a street-based project. It, it, you know, I would describe it as, a, as an activation, street activation project. And I think that brings us to this biggest is, bigger issue of cities and what makes cities good. Uh, and the book is called Creating, Creating Cities. And streets, for a lot of people in urbanism, the, the street is the heart of the city. Mm. And you can have plazas and you can have parks, but the sort of, you, know, you could argue that um, the city sort of lives and dies on, on, on the street. What's your take, Marcus, on what makes people want to live in cities and, and what are the key adjacencies that make a city, city work? Um, I, th- I mean, I think the key things is that people want... Uh, th- th- What I think makes a city work is the complexity and density of experiences and relationships. It's the idea that within, you know, any given direction, there are hundreds or thousands of people that are doing things that have, that you want to connect with and engage with to varying degrees. And I think, you know, the the thing that we're, uh, I guess that, the, the two ends of the spectrum that I was sort of responding to with Renew that frustrate me about cities is on one level, you've got, um, you've got a failure, it was, was so evident in Newcastle, you had this failure to utilise the city to allow a diversity of experience to come through. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I think you've got the danger that's much more evident in Melbourne now, which is you've got this, the corporate monoculture, you know, sort of gradual, like the, the highest value use driving out the diversity of other experiences and uses that actually, you know, you want to have there. So, you know, whether that's chain stores or large scale, whatever it may be. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 a city for me is a place that works when anyone who is there has the capacity to shape it by their actions. Like they can do things to it and with it, in it, as opposed to a place where you have that, that sort of, you know, um, creator, consumer, you know, capital and consumer kind of dynamic, which, mm. which I think increasingly is reshaping a lot of the cities around the world in it's one very monocultured image. Would it be too simplistic to say that's a, just a generally more bottoms-up approach to the city? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think... Yes, it would be too, more sim- it would be too simplistic. No, 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 no. yes, it's exactly yeah. the point. I mean, it's, it, I think is that the city, this idea of a city as something you shape through your actions is something, you know, sort of, there's a story in the beginning about, uh, in the book about my grandfather. He built a sign, like in the, in, I guess in the 60s, um, for this park up the road from his house. And... Um, it's still there. It's 50 years old now. It's still there. And I, I still don't know exactly what process he went through to do that. But every time I went past it, I sort of see this sign and think, you know, my grandfather made that in his back shed because for whatever reason, you know, he felt the need to fix a problem in his city. And I think, um, you know, if you go back to that era, I mean, a lot of the infrastructure of our cities, bowling clubs and, you know, service clubs and parks, but it were built by people kind of pooling their sweat and their effort and their... their their imagination into doing stuff. And I think increasingly we, we live in cities that are driven by the top-down influence of culture. And somewhere along the line, like Newcastle is such a great... Uh, Renew is, I guess, such a great example of that. We literally forgot mm. that there's this incredible resource, which is all of the imaginations and ideas and enthusiasm of the people who live here, which is a different resource to, um, you know, th- how do we attract a $500 million property equity investor to come in and transform the place? And I think that cities where that capacity is alive and... Um, manifest in the fabric of the city are ones you want to be in. They're distinctive places, they're original places, they're places that reflect their own character and culture and they're places that reward you for discovering them and spending time in them. And I think that historical idea of the city is a place of uh, making, I think you maybe make this point in the in the TV show more than the book, that, that, that traditionally um, when you look at the, say, the Hunter Street historically it was a place of it was a place of making, it was a place of retail, it was a place of exchange. And at some point in the 20th century, and I suspect it's through the planning concept of zoning, streets became kind of more about retail and not a lot else. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I actually, it was only a couple, it was a couple of years into Renew, and I actually went through these, I found these old archives of photos of Hunter Street, Newcastle, 
in the what, turn of the 20th century, so the, you know, 1890s through to about 1910. And as I looked up, some of the same buildings are still there. It's still great, you know, it's a great historical streetscape in Newcastle. A lot of the buildings are still there. But, you know, what I had never twigged was that when these buildings were built, they were built as places where people created things and they lived. They weren't built as places where people bought things that were made somewhere else. That actually came a generation later, probably, you know, sort of probably in the between the wars and the immediate post-war era. And then that in turn, if you if you imagine cities are places of consumption of things that are made elsewhere, then the mass production you know, the, the mass-produced model, the mass retail model forces everything out to suburban shopping centres, which make a lot more... They're much better places to buy stuff loaded in in bulk that came from somewhere else. Um, but to sort of, you know, I thought... I literally thought we were doing something completely original that no-one had ever thought of when I started getting makers and creators into these buildings. And then I suddenly went, oh, all right, I was just, you know... I'm about 150 years late on that idea. Mm. <laughs> And I think this is just to elaborate that idea of zoning. I mean, one of the great legacies of 20th century planning was this concept of zoning. And Melbourne, to some extent, has now recovered from that concept. Uh, and and other, other Australian capital cities are in the process of doing so, which is, you know, really about saying this use happens here, this use happens here. And most people now recognise that that was a wildly naive, naive approach. And if you want a diversity of experiences, and I agree completely, you need to move away from a model of, of zoning to the point where you actually question what, what, what that's useful for at all. I mean, initially it was designed so there wasn't an aluminium smelter next to your house. Mm -hmm. Now that there are really, you know, uh, uh, the less of those kind of uses, it, it seems to be less of a concern. But I wanted to talk a bit about um, making and manufacturing. And uh, again, in the, in the bespoke TV show, you know, there, was a, there was a very potent idea that you developed, which is really around your obsession with uh, Etsy and... Mm. And, and this idea that we're actually, you know, despite, despite the uh, headlines, in fact, we might be making quite a lot of stuff, but we're just not making cars in, in big factories in Fisherman's Bend or mm. Elizabeth in South Australia. We're actually making stuff in bedrooms, and that bedrooms are now the kind of powerhouses of Australian making and retailing in, in a sort of craft size, side. And, all, and so I guess to some extent, Rudy really New was about providing a s contemporary space for this new mm. way of making. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the things we discovered when we started, I mean, and this wasn't the initial motivation, but it was the first thing, one of the first things I learned when I started doing it. When you start to put a shingle in the, in the ground, it says, we've got spaces for people who create stuff. Suddenly realised we're tapping into this huge wave of people who are making and creating and we're already doing it. Like, a lot of the times we were putting people into shops in Newcastle who were already running businesses in Newcastle that were exporting stuff they made all around the world. It's just you couldn't see them. Mm. It's just it's, by the act of giving them a, a high street presence... They were making their, it in bedrooms and... And they were, yeah, bedrooms, sunrooms, spare rooms, garages, you know, wherever it is that people do these things. And so, um, you know, and then the more I looked into that, like, I, I retrospect, you know, belatedly discovered, like, the ABS data... There was a 700% increase in the number of people making jewellery in Australia in the six years leading up to when we started Renew. And what I find extraordinary is that, like, that that isn't what that wasn't. No, someone from the ABS didn't freak out and go 700%. Like, what's the, you know, what on earth is driving that? And I think a lot of it is technology. As part of it's a cultural shift, it's a change in cultural values, but a lot of it's also technology where people can now make things from anywhere and sell them to but it's anywhere. it's the selling that's the change, right? Yeah. It's the internet, basically. And the, com the community around that. It's, support the, it's both the, the marketplace and it's the community that can support you both technically and morally to do that stuff, I think. Max, I want to talk a little bit more about the book as, as, as a form, um, given we're at the Wheeler Centre. Um, one of the things uh, you immediately notice about the book is it's quite compact in size, very handy to carry around. I didn't write a lot of words. <laughs> and it also has absolutely no pictures in it, which for the uh, visually uh, literate like myself is was initially challenging. But the good thing about that is it actually forces you to, to read it rather than sort of <laughs> say you're reading it. Oh, I'm reading it. Oh, I see shops yeah, now active. <laughs> you actually got to read it and engage with the literary form and engage with the narrative quality. Was that a deliberate thing, keeping the pictures out? Um, yes and no. I think there is a great picture book to be done on Renew. We actually have, like, mostly when I talk about it, I, I stand with pictures. And I've got before photos of empty streets with boarded up and smashed in windows and no people walking down them. And I've got photos of the same buildings, 
you know, a few years later with people sitting out the front and life and activity and, you know, mostly I sort of, I tend to over-rely on those when I talk. So there's a, but with this incredible archive of pictures, it would be a great, mm. great project to do. Um, I, I was publishing it myself. It was crowdfunded. I didn't need more people involved in the project. I was already running late. So um, the, uh, the I, I am a, I, I guess I'm a writer, you know, like I, I have been a writer. I have written stuff professionally. I'm not a, you know, my, my skill set, I have some skill set with the written word. It's the form I felt comfortable in. And, yep. um, but yeah, one of these days, there's a great picture book and map book and all of that stuff. And if we contrast that with the other form that you've worked in, television, it's also quite a personal-based um, mm. approach that you're on camera quite a lot. Yep. You're meeting people, talking to them, looking impressed and concerned and those sort of things. <laughs> it, do you, do you find that, do you, do you, what's the sharpest contrast between writing about the thing that you're interested in and then doing it with a TV crew and flying around the country? Um, I think t television's a different beast in terms of, A, it's an incredibly collaborative me. I mean, part of the advantage of writing a book like this is that I essentially, you know, wrote and published my own book given the resources that we, you know, the process that I engaged in. I had a bit of, I had help doing that. But uh, television is an incredibly collaborative medium. So it's producers, directors, executive producers, lots and lots of people involved in the process. I think... Um, I actually really like TV as a medium. Like, I think it's, it gets a bit of a bad rap in terms of its... Um, well, it's a lot of shit television in the world. But actually, I think TV is a medium that allows you to have a lot of... You can explore... A co I think, you know, I like to think what I've tried to do is explore complicated ideas in ways that are actually quite engaging and you don't necessarily realise that, you know, you've been taken on this journey. But it does rely a lot on visuals. It relies a lot on character and drama and narrative and, you know, like setting up these things and also television the other thing about television is just how you know incredibly repetitive it is to make mm. you know like just how you know or how out of sequence and disorientating it is to make and how much of it's actually sort of you know put together in the edit suite afterwards but there are certainly times when you know you sort of do five interviews in a day and then you have to do a piece to camera and um you know, for, for, you know, I stuff it up 12 times, the cameraman stuffs it up six times, the, you know, that some loud noise comes over, you know, and by the end of it, it's just like, you know, you've just got to s smile more and be m more enthusiastic. And I'm just like, it's beaten out of me, but I'm still here, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I did want to mention um, uh, that uh, the current Prime Minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, did mention your book uh, recently. He's, he's, who we talk about bureaucracy, he's, he's advocating this book down through the, Chains of the bureaucracy as a as an example of the new era. I, I, yes, he's 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 been quite enthusiastic. It's kind of weird. I, 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 so um, Adam Bant from the Greens was one of the people who originally supported the crowdfunding campaign. Anthony Albanese was um, offering to launch the book in Sydney for various reasons um, that didn't happen, but he's been out there enthusiastically spruiking it. And now Malcolm Turnbull has been talking it up. So I'm going to do Middle East peace next. I, think. <laughs> uh, I actually I'm a bit I'm a bit amazed that everyone uh, that uh, that have been embraced across the whole spectrum there but um no he's uh, he's been quite enthusiastic about it and um i'm you know i'm pleased and i'm paying him royalties <laughs> he hasn't noticed <laughs> they're, they're much more financially significant to me than they are to him no but he's good he, he spruced it before christmas and then he's been doing talks about it recently so yeah it's good um hopefully he'll give us a bucket of money for something yes that does that feel weird having the prime minister talk about your yeah book <laughs> Um, we, I also wanted to talk, we've got a few minutes before we'll open up for questions, I want to talk about what you've been doing at the moment in terms of the uh, Contemporary Arts, Arts Precincts project. Um, you're, you're running this relatively new institution. It's not an institution. Relatively new... Thing. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about what it's aiming to do and tell us about that fantastic, sort of very important cultural site, uh, maybe more than an architectural site, um, in, in Collingwood, uh, in and around the Keith Herring Memorial. Yeah. Memorial? Mural. No, mural. Yes. It is also a sort of Keith Hegging memorial yes. now too. Yes. Um, it's, um, yeah, so uh, since the uh, beginning of February this year, I've, I've taken on a new role. I'm, I'm now the CEO of the Collingwood Arts Precinct and the entity that runs that. Um, and it's the old Collingwood TAFE site, basically, in Johnson, between Johnson and Perry Street. And if people know, it's near where the Herring Mural is and where Circus Oz is. It's, so there's three buildings, uh, great central courtyard, about 6,000 square metres of, of building space. Um, it's a three-year project to convert that from... Um, there's some parts of the space that are usable at the moment and then uh, it's three years before we'll actually have it fully up and open. And I, it's, it's really exciting for me. It's a great... Like, if you walk through those spaces, it's absolutely incredible to see those buildings. There's amazing sort of community around there and vast, you know, sort of 
labyrinth of really interesting spaces to be part of. I think Collingwood is a really interesting place at the moment because there's so many layers of things going on there from new apartments to, you know, communities that have been there for a long time and have been uh, threatened. And then there's a great sort of cultural community around there that is in danger of being priced out. So if we can... if uh, the, the goal for this precinct, I think, is to to provide a dynamic cultural anchor in that precinct for generations to come. And so it's kind of, it, the, the, you know, on one level, I'm working with a lot of the same stuff I was working with with Renew. I'm working with empty, you know, empty buildings and creative people that want to do things in them. On another level, like the time scales are just completely different. Like, you know, like uh, Renew projects are all on buildings that are borrowed for 30 days at a time. I'm, I'm three months in, I don't have the keys to our buildings yet. And then it's, you know, it's a, it's a, um, you know, you're trying to set up something that's going to continue to be dynamic and relevant for generations, and that's a really interesting, you know, set of challenges to think about. And so, so the, who are the sorts of um, groups that you're hoping to get in there? What, what, you know, ideally, you're looking at a, a very diverse range of... I, th I think it's going to be a mixture, mixture of established... I'll, I'll be careful. Like, there are names have been mentioned in the past. I've got to be careful as we go through a process that we haven't yet gone through. But it's going to be a mixture of esta established arts organisations, um, creative industries in various kinds. I think we want to make sure that it's a precinct that um, is um, vibrant and interesting. It should be a place to have good coffee and someone to have a drink and hang out and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, my goal is to put together a mix of things on that site that is greater than the sum of its parts. So by virtue of bringing these things into proximity, you start to get connections and relationships between, uh, uh, you know, artists or creative people who previously might not have thought to work together. So I'm looking for those kind of synergies and, and relationships as we as we go. So that sort of intensity of activity, that, that really is akin to a busy street, but it's a sort of different form. It's a, mo it's a sort of, it has street frontages, but it also has a campus feel to it as well. Yeah, it's a precinct. And so I think that's why I jumped on the, when you said institution, because it's not an institution. It's not yeah. a singular thing. It's a diverse mix of things you're deliberately bringing together for a series of reasons. So, um, you know, I'm very much, uh, you know, this, I've got to be careful, it's early stages and lots of processes to go through, but trying to really create a space that brings people physically and creatively into proximity with each other. And in some ways, is it the logical extension of Renew in the sense that it, um, it's kind of Renew, which is operated so, you know, uh, in such an agile way, if we might use the contemporary language, in an innovative way? Mm. Oh, uh, there's never been a better time. <laughs> that's, that's right. So it, to take that Renew process, project that's worked in this sort of sub-regulatory way to some extent and now take the sort of legacy and lessons of that and put it back into something that by definition, as you've indicated, is now exposed to the more regulatory environment with, with all the sort of... DAs and yeah, I mean, we, sort of it's not the, the Renew existed in a regulatory environment. We didn't make it go away, but I think yeah. we thought about what the consequences of that were for creativity. I think the same thing applies here. I think I'm very conscious of not. Um, I think one of the dangers you can make with a creative precinct, if you look at them, is that often they become very stale after after a relatively short period of time because you put together a mix of things that made sense in, you know, I keep saying I don't want to fossilise 2016's idea of what an interesting creative mix is for generations to come. So trying to make sure that we design it in such a way that we've got some things that are enduring and going to be there for a long time and other parts that are operating, you know, where people can come and start things and do things and try things and test things in those spaces and not simply lock it all up in, in a space that is fossilizing you know? so it might churn over you, you, you I think what you're trying to say you're trying to avoid what happens with a lot of per, uh, a lot of uh, cultural centers in Australia like the Perth Cultural Center and others where they become the kind of cultural acropolis and they sort of get frozen in time I think it's also really important yeah and I think it's also really important to have a diversity of different things that are bringing in people for different reasons so it's not just you know yeah. you know I think the worst case scenario is you end up with a sort of citadel of contemporary art that people who don't feel like they're part of the club don't feel like they're invited into yeah I was curious if you had any ideas about um what can be done in more of the outer suburbs, uh, where there aren't necessarily like empty spaces That's waiting to be question. used? And mm. Yeah, I mean, well, a, a, there are a lot of empty spaces in the outer suburbs. I mean, I think that's one of the observations I've had since with Renew Australia is travelling around and realising there's a lot of um, community... Like, you know, anywhere there's a big shopping centre, somewhere nearby there's a main street that got killed by it, you know? Like, it's, uh, there's, there's often that relationship. I think one of the things we started to notice with Renew is that you have a... Um, a really wide cross-section of creativity. There are people from, you know, 
people that are creating and making interesting things in their sunrooms and spare rooms and garages and whatever are actually everywhere. So I think we need to think... The question is, how do you create a cultural infrastructure that allows people that are creating and collaborating to meet each other in those communities and to actually take it to the next level in those communities. And that part of that's about physical infrastructure, part of that's about, you know, you can sort of see, you can see a rise of, you know, suburban craft markets and design markets and other things that are um, a manifestation of that. But I think we need to also, you know, the thing we sort of need to turn around. I think for a long time we sort of lived off this paradigm of the idea that the, the city centre is the place where people create and, you know, sell culture and they come in from the suburbs to consume it. I think we sort of need to flip that over and provide infrastructure to support people creating and connecting around cultural production, not just in the inner city. That's good. How do you like try and attract uh, new community ideas to a space like what you've got in Collingwood? Sorry, can I just get the first part of that again? How do you try and attract uh, new um, community sort of ideas to a uh, space like what you've got in Collingwood? Um, I think part of that's about being open, being open to people coming forward with ideas. And I, I think it also, it's a part of it is about um, managing, as I said before, I think you've got to have spaces operating in different time cycles. You've got to have spaces where people can start things and try things and a range of communities can be. Um, I think... There's a danger, as I said, in, if you sort of lock it all up in a sort of institutional framework, it becomes very hard for people that are not part of those institutions to be part of it. So my role, I think, um, we're gonna, we, we need to identify and, and sort out who our key anchor tenants of that precinct are going to be, but it's also holding a lot of space back to allow different people to come in and try stuff. The other thing that I'm also doing very consciously, and we'll, we'll launch publicly in the second half of this year, is the space between now and when it opens is a space to allow for experimentation. So we want to invite lots of people in to try things and start things and do things in those spaces and let that inform the final form of what we actually do um, and rather than the traditional model, which is one where you sort of come in with a sort of top-down vision, sort of architect design, and then you sort of put the thing there and put the other thing there, and then you realise it doesn't work in terms of how people flow and you spend a lot of money fixing it, I'd like to sort of test some of those things. So um, we will, uh, once we actually get the keys and get into the building start doing that sort of stuff, we will be openly calling for people to come to us with ideas they want to test and try and inviting communities that we're seeking out into the space to do things and visit it and be part of it. So in, so in that way, sort of, a, it's a blurred opening process. It sort of comes yeah, into being in a... I, I'm still trying to find the right language because I think we need, to, we need to kind of make a distinction between when it opens because we've got, a, you know, got a lot of work to do, a lot of money to raise, a lot of building and all this sort of stuff that needs to be done. But I'm also very conscious that you just can't hold everything back. So we've got to find the right language. I think we will, we will, you know, a ribbon will be cut, a plaque will be, you know, done, and that's going to take place in the second half of 2018. Yeah. But that we're not leaving it till then to get value out of the site. We want to be using it and, and evolving it and shaping it between now and then. Or a stainless steel shovel. Um, do we have more questions? Yes. Excellent. Hi. Yeah, uh, you mentioned earlier that... Um, when you were working on Renew in Newcastle, you were careful not to act as curator for the yeah. types of activities that might take place. And I just wondered how, in relation to the um, Collingwood uh, um, plan, plans in Collingwood, how um, moving from place to place, you might consider how that space, those, um, that rejuvenation would be relative to the sort of local character of the area, whether you're careful to note whether you want to revive certain activities or whether you want to revive certain things that are place-specific and how you might... Revive. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's... Inherently, I think... So there's a lot of stuff about place specificity. What I've found with working with Renew to, is that you know it's, it's now a model that's that's operating in 20 or 30 communities around the world, and every single one of those is churning up a very different mix of things. It's a platform into which a local person with an idea can put something there. Um, I think the role in Collingwood is more curatorial than the Renew role. It's not. It's it, it, you know you need to make decisions about what you're doing and what you're not doing and why. But I'm also very conscious of we don't want to be sort of going down the path of the curator as tastemaster that's trying to kind of fit everything around their idea of what things should be. So you know it, it's it is still quite consciously plural and diverse, but it's not 
um, you know, it's it's not. You know, it, it can't be just by virtue of its scale and its longevity and the resources that it needs. A just throw it at the wall and see what sticks approach. Um, so I think uh, reviving is an interesting term because when you talk about trying to revive what's been there, I, I'm I'm very conscious of the history of that site. Like I actually think it's been a it's been a place of teaching, making, design, art. You know, all of those things that have been taught there and the communities that have been nurtured there, I think should inform what happens in the site. I'm also very conscious that I don't want to be creating a, what's the word, you know, like a, a you know, a museum or a, or a sort of, artif you know, an artificial version or a kind of, you know, a, a fake. A new, a new theme park. Yeah, a facade of like, you know, what was the thing that was there once. So um, I'm letting those ideas inform where we're going with the site, but I'm also being really conscious of not, you know, being fake or false about that. Hi. Um, I, I love your, you know, definition of what a city is, somewhere where people can come in and make it their own. Um, there isn't a singular definition, of course, and one of the many definitions of a city would be, you know, the idea of a, a grand piazza. I guess I, I want to know how successful you think we have been, Melbourne has been, you know, trying to live up to the idea of the grand piazza and... Do we have one? Apart from Federation Square, how successful have we been? Thanks. Um, so the, the qualifier I need to put on all this is that I've actually been living in Melbourne for 14 years. So like, like everyone's kind of, since I started this Collingwood job, everyone's been like, oh, so are you moving to Melbourne? It's like, I actually made like 40 return trips from Melbourne to Newcastle when I was getting that going. And it's kind of nice to be doing something near where I live. So um, I think M Melbourne's a really interesting city. I think... Um, Melbourne has, has either been really lucky or had really good leadership or probably a combination of both. I think the scale and diversity of what Melbourne supports in its city has, is the reason why I moved to Melbourne. I moved from Newcastle to Sydney and then I've ultimately moved down to Melbourne. And just that, the way in which Melbourne supports the fine grain and culture, you know, a really diverse range of things. I remember coming to Melbourne in the 90s and thinking, like, this is a place where people like me are doing stuff, which wasn't the case in Sydney at all and was really impossible to do in Newcastle. So I think Melbourne's got sort of fantastic kind of structure in which it's building up from that stuff. But I'm also, you know, I'm also very mindful that um, the scale and pace and nature of change in Melbourne threatens that. You know, like I think there's a there's a there's a difficult balancing act. Increasingly, Melbourne, you know, um, I, I'm one of these days. If I write another book, well, I probably won't. But um, I, I'm I'm really interested in the idea of the way in which capital reshapes cities in its image. If that's a really weird thing to say, I don't know. But like Melbourne increasingly looks like it's it's th it's at risk of becoming a place where the logic of how you finance a city dictates its form, and I think um, that's that's a big, you know, it's a big challenge in any city. Like if you travel, particularly to fast growing you know, Asian cities, they're all becoming the same because they're all being driven by the same logic of capital rewriting those places. And so, um, you know, I think that's the challenge, but I think Melbourne has so many great layers that protect it against that. Its original grid form, its original, the, the various communities that meet here, the richness of, th this conversation is happening in Melbourne. This conversation wouldn't be happening in Sydney. It, you know, or, or, you know, the layers of community radio and uh, community, like Melbourne is, a, is, is at least very well informed about its challenges, which I think set it up well. I'm interested in Docklands, the disaster that's Docklands. You were going to ask a question. I'd really like to know what it is. Uh, you'd need about an hour for me to talk about Docklands. I don't know how long... I don't want you to talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> no, you don't want me talking about it. Markets. Yeah, well, Renew Australia's been doing a project. So it's one of our uh, successful, you know, first places we started doing a project. And, and it's such a great... Phenomenal contrast to Newcastle is working Docklands with, a, you know, the reason I want to write a book about how capital reshapes cities in its images is partially from the experience of working in, with Docklands. But um, you, I don't, th I don't think it'd be shocking anyone to say they they kind of broke the city when they built that. You know, the scale was wrong, the the pace was wrong, the the allowing it to, you know, it, I mean. 
Yeah. Look, I, 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 it would need an hour, I think, to, to really to really go into that. I, th I don't want to just pile on with the same observations that everyone's made about Docklands and why it's not functioning. But what I, what I took away from my experience, the experience of working with Dockland, which has informed other work of Renew and now informs advice I give um, uh, uh, other communities when I've been doing work with Renew Australia has been the one the thing that the thing that was so fascinating to look at with Dockland is is how prescriptive it was. Like they designed it so you go along that strip where you've got the twenty or whatever waterfront restaurants, and they were designed in such a way that they could only ever be restaurants. You know, like uh, without you couldn't not you couldn't there was no way of turning them to anything else without spending a huge amount of money. You spend a huge amount of money making restaurants, and then you spend a huge amount of money because you've spent a huge amount of money. You have to spend a huge amount of money doing something else, or you can't allow them to evolve. And I think the thing I noticed instantly between working in Docklands and working in Newcastle was, in Newcastle, we're working with a set of buildings that had been invented and reinvented constantly over time. So I think there's a there's a lesson in the danger of whether you've got the best plan or the worst plan, the danger of having a plan that is so prescriptive it doesn't allow for evolution, change, trial and error and failure. And I look at Docklands and I think you know, all the other big picture planning stuff and whatever, why is that there, why is that not there, why they put the stadium in the middle and all, you know, whatever. But on a really basic level, they designed it so it had to be... And, and this is, goes back to the, the, the needs of capital. Capital wanted the illusion that they were building something that was predictable. They wanted the illusion that if you put that there, that can be a Starbucks and we'll rent it for this amount of money and whatever. And the moment that bubble burst or that illusion failed, it wasn't designed to be a place shaped by actions. That was never built into the contingency of it. So I think, um, you know, without piling onto all the other stuff, I think that's the, on the micro level of seeing Docklands, you know, you could have designed and saved yourself a whole lot of trouble by thinking about designing it to evolve, not designing it to be what looked like a good idea at the time. I think that would then be a city. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yep. Uh, uh, join me um, in thanking Marcus Westbury. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.